Okay, so the circuit boards have arrived. And this great big box of components have arrived. And I have my parts list all printed out in order of resistors and then miscellaneous components and then the connectivity components in order. So I can do the smaller components first and then do the sockets and then connectivity. So I'm going to be doing this board here on the right hand side first. And this board is the video generation board. Uh, you can see the inputs up here on the top left. Uh, these are for the different video planes. One of the planes will be the character generation plane here. Uh, this contains all of the logic for, for generating character displays from character RAM and also the RAM definition for each character. Um, the video generation board uh, contains a lot of resistor ladders up here, uh, also connected to individual palette RAMs to supply the color information. Uh, various different output options are going to be available here on the right hand side. So I've got various different connectors there and I've also got the option of having some variable resistors up here on the top right. So I, if I need to I can adjust the resistance going into the color combination. So this is going to be a rather interesting build. Uh, I have a very big spool of solder in here somewhere. Uh, oh, there it is. That was actually used on my previous build probably about 12, 14 years ago now. So starting with the video generation board here on the right hand side will allow me to not see much at all actually because there won't be any pixel inputs coming in here but what I can do is that I can set these pixel inputs and I can program in some palette memory options which go into these color calculations here, color calculation logic here with the associated RAMs and this will allow me to test whether or not the, the video generation signal is uh, good and I will be testing it by tying these outputs here which are H-Sync and V-Sync uh, plus RGB output so I'm going to be tying those through um, unfortunately I don't have a TV which currently uh, takes those kind of inputs so what I will do is that I will channel those inputs through um, a VGA SCART converter board that I have uh, which is normally used for uh, retro computing uh, like old arcade machines and trying to get it to output to um, HDMI so I'll use that board uh, that board also outputs some nice uh, timing diagnostics uh, I've used that board as well for uh, connecting RGB output from my Commodore 65s which I tested about a month ago so this board first test whether or not the video signal is good test whether or not the uh, pixel input here, 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 and here in combination then results in good color output here. This will probably be um, single color output, although I might create a very simple timer circuit to uh, pulse the pixel line. So then I should be able to see uh, quite counting or, or ran, you know, pseudo random information inside the pixels. So that's what I'm going to do. So for pretty much every single one of these IC sockets here, I've ordered a bunch of um, different sockets with integrated decoupling capacitors. These are 
a lifesaver. It means that you do not really need to populate boards that are about this size with separate decoupling capacitors uh, because you've got a decoupling capacitor on every single socket. Um, it also means that when I'm soldering this up, I am not risking uh, overheating the components. Um, I, all of the components will be socketed, which means that it will be easier for me to troubleshoot and replace. Um, and it also makes it just easier to, to solder and maintain the board that way. So I'm going to be predominantly using these for every single IC socket here. The only socket that will not uh, receive one of those is because it's too small. Probably the crystal socket, which is down here, in the bottom left hand corner here, with the clock generation logic. Um, and that's because the, the, the crystal is, is so tiny that it doesn't really need it. Uh, there is an oscillator. So this IC here, which is actually not an IC as such, it's actually uh, got an option uh, with this jumper here to either have a, a crystal and relevant timing logic here with uh, capacitors and resistors, or um, it can switch it can not be connected and actually switch over to use an oscillator as well so the oscillator has all of the logic integrated so I've got this little jumper here which allows me to select whether or not I want to use oscillator or a clock crystal but in this build I'll be using a clock crystal so I've bought the relevant components for that interesting things to note across these two circuit boards are the uh, identical headers here and here across the two boards. So these two boards are, they can be connected by a ribbon cable or uh, what I'm currently planning is to have the boards stacked like this with uh, connectors and pins in between. So I want to have vertical stacking, I don't really want to have horizontal stacking. Now the character board here up in the top left hand corner here, outputs uh, one layer of pixels. So this is the output for one layer of pixels and it can go into any of these pixel inputs here. The pixel inputs from here are then merged together with plain prioritization so that there is only one pixel uh, output here with the resistor ladders. So what this means is that for these identical headers here, we have, if I zoom in a little bit more, uh, we can see here that this one is the video header. This contains uh, various different clocks, uh, mostly a six megahertz clock, uh, plus also um, clocks for loading color information, loading, uh, character definition or sprite definition. So all of the timing for all of these clocks flows through this header here. Uh, we have the main expansion bus header here, which deals with all of the RAM and data signals from uh, the external memory interface. So the external memory interface is designed to uh, address up to 24 bits of memory. So we have the extra upper eight bits of memory flowing through this interface here because there's actually quite a lot of addressable RAM. When I was converting this and upgrading it from the old BombJack hardware, uh, the old BombJack hardware used a lot of ROMs, um, but I wanted to have this updatable and usable by lots of other computers, so I actually updated the whole thing to use RAMs. So I wanted to have a lot of addressable RAM, so that's what we've got. So this external RAM interface is designed to interface via something like an old 8-bit computer's user port or a cartridge port or a memory expansion port or anything like that. So this interface here is going to be um, platform agnostic. The 
interface which plugs into an 8-bit computer can then have any of the, any of the kind of supporting logic needed to uh, increment memory addresses or send over data depending on the constraints of the 8-bit computer's external interface ports. So on different computers there will be different constraints. So some of them might only be 4-bit or 2-bit output. Some of them might have 8 bits but not the ability to address such large amounts of RAM. So there's going to be some protocol variation depending on the 8-bit computer which is actually using this or interfacing this. But the protocol then ends here at this point where there is a consistent 24-bit uh, memory interface with 8-bit data input here. And likewise, the, the V-Sync signal also comes out through here as well, and then we'll get tied back. Actually, it comes out through here, and then it will get it will get tied back through the eight-bit computer memory interface. Usually, say for example, on the Commodore sixty-four, uh, the user port when you bring one of the external user port lines low, uh, it will cause an internal uh, interrupt sometimes an NMI, I think it is, on the Commodore 64. Uh, and then this interrupt can be either polled with the interrupts disabled, or it can be enabled to create uh, an interrupt at that particular point in time. So this video card actually runs at 60 hertz. So depending on if you have a PAL or NTSC Commodore 64, what I anticipate is that uh, most of the time the Commodore 64 would be operated with its screen, its VIC chip, disabled, and all of the timing and all of the video output going through this board here. It's entirely possible that you could run two displays as well at the same time if you wanted to. Um, but to uh, enable this 60 megahertz board, to uh, allow it to drive the video signal sync, then passing that back through, say for example, the user port, would make it would make sense to have the Commodore 64's display uh, turned off. So one, you are able to save all of the CPU time that would have normally been spent um, in memory contention with the VIC chip. You claw all of that time back. Um, but it also means that then your Commodore 64 code would then always be syncing with the 60 hertz display generated by this board, regardless of whether or not the Commodore 64 is PAL or NTSC, because you're basing all of your synchronization, your vSync synchronization, off this. Uh, this bus interface here will also allow um, an external copper board to be created, so in combination with all of the video signals here and the data signals here, um, and also the, the, the pixel outputs here, it would be possible to look at the, uh, the rows and columns for the output pixels from this header, and then to assert one or more uh, pixel logic settings here which will then give you copper settings across all of the planes, or just one of the planes if you wanted to. Uh, and then you can generate some really nice uh, funky effects with having, depending on, on the layers which have been built and enabled on this common bus interface here, it will allow you to uh, scroll different areas of the screen at different rates. Um, it would allow you to, say for example, use a technique called multiplexing on the sprites. So the sprites, board, which actually the sprites board isn't here because the sprites board is very large and I actually want to make sure that I can build this one properly and then build this one properly before progressing on to the larger sprites board and then the larger uh, background logic board and then also the huge mode 7 board. Uh, the, the mode 7 board will probably be about twice the size of these in combination to be honest, maybe even three times. So I want to make sure I can build these properly. So. But basically, the, the copper board would be interrupting the pixel signals here, which will then give you the ability to then multiplex the sprites because you can update the sprite registers based on their horizontal and vertical positions, pixel positions. Here, as the screen is scanning down and across, 
and you can change the update the sprite positions here and then you can have say for example one copy of sprite up here and then you can change their definitions halfway down the screen and then you'll be rendering a different set of sprites down here so this technique called multiplexing allows you to double or triple or even quadruple depending on the amount of time that you have the number of visible sprites that you can display on screen which is quite cool but the mode 7 logic the character logic the um, background 16 by 16 tiles display logic um, all feed off these pixel clock values here and also the uh, definition and color loading signals here plus all of the pixel clock information. So all of these different layers can be updated as the screen scans down from top to bottom, left to right, which will give you access to quite a lot of very powerful effects. So that's why uh, I would want to also, at some point, build the, uh, the copper board. But this board first, then this board, and then we'll see how it goes.